see on here if necessary. Okay, so I think we can start now. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato sama sambuddhasa. Buddhang dhammang sankhang namasami. So, on the word of the Buddha class, here we are now up to uh, uh, chapter 7, sort of, the right mindfulness. So, you've got it on right mindfulness as well. Very good. Because they say that uh, if you practice mindfulness, your memory gets very strong. Uh, but it's not as strong <laughs> as a computer's memory. So, well done. You got it the right place. So, here is the translation, Seventh Factor of the Eightfold Path. So, as usual, I will just go through a little bit and then we'll answer uh, any questions. What now is right mindfulness, the four focuses of mindfulness? And you see straight away, just changing it from the four foundations of mindfulness, you know, what they actually stand on, to actually to how mindfulness is directed, where it's actually to go to, to be able to find some interesting um, insights. So instead of foundations, I always call it like the focuses, where you should put your mindfulness on. So the four focuses of mindfulness lead in one direction only, to the purification of beings, to going beyond sadness and crying, to the disappearance of physical and mental suffering, to the attainment of the true way for the realization of Nibbana. Now you see also, as you come to this class over here, that instead of following these old translations, which are sometimes a bit, as they say in English, a bit dodgy, uh, the first change you see there, which is following uh, the translation of uh, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. It's a four focuses of mindfulness lead in one direction only. And it is quite clear that it does not mean that it's the only way. I know that sometimes people say that the uh, four focuses of mindfulness, satipatthana, is uh, the only way to enlightenment but that is not consistent with the other teachings in the suttas where the Buddha said the only way to enlightenment is Eightfold Path, yes. And that's, <laughs> that's in the Magga, um, Magga uh, Pada, in the Dhammapada. The, it's called Ezo wa Mago, this is the only way, Nati Anya, there's not another, Dasana Suvisuddhya, for the purification of your insight. Uh, that's the Eightfold Path. So, but what it means, it's called Ekayana, and it's a one going. And that word Ekayana is used in another place, which is actually the very next sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, and it is referring to, uh, this is where the Buddha was explaining the understanding of karma. There is some karma, which you know is going to lead to a bad destination. There's another type of karma which leads to good rebirth. You say, how can you know that? It's just like seeing a person walking in a path, a path through the jungle, which leads to a pit of burning coals. And there's no um, offshoot, no left turn, no right turn. It's just, it just goes in that direction. He calls that a kayana, like a one going. And that's the only time that, that same word is used in different contexts in the um, in the uh, in the Tripitaka, so what Akayana literally means is it goes in one direction, no U-turns, no sort of offshoots. It goes in the one direction only. So what uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation is very very accurate there, and it's a bit sort of mischievous uh, if anyone says it's the only way, because that only way is referred to the Eightfold Path. So the four focuses of mindfulness lead in one direction only, to the purification of beings, to going beyond sadness and crying, to the disappearance of physical and mental suffering, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of Nibbana. And we see over here why it means that it's uh, leading one direction only. The first four focuses of mindfulness, number one, having restrained the five hindrances, you abide aware of the body, energized, knowing the purpose of what you're doing, and mindful. 
Having restrained the five hindrances, you abide aware of experience, Vedana, energized, knowing the purpose of what you're doing and mindful. Having restrained the five hindrances, you abide aware of the mind, Chitta, energized, knowing the purpose of what you're doing and mindful. Having restrained the five hindrances, you abide aware of mind objects, energized, knowing the purpose of what you're doing and mindful. So there's a lot of repetition there, but this is the time I'm uh, repeating that initial phrase, having restrained the five hindrances, you abide aware of either the body, experience, mind or mind objects, energized, knowing the purpose of what you are doing, and mindful. And the, where we say having restrained the five hindrances, uh, the normal, usual, common translation is, uh, um, what's it called, uh, having abandoned grief and covetousness for the world. That was the translation which was originated by uh, Professor Rice Davids over a hundred years ago. And of course, uh, having abandoned grief and covetousness for the world is a really bit strange translation. If grief for the world, you may have like grief for say your, your mother or your, your best friend, but grief for the world, you don't really use the word in that way. And uh, covetousness for the world, Again, covetousness is not a word which we often use these days. And that you will find if you study the suttas in the original Pali, you will find those two words are loke abhija domanasang, and they are used in many other cases. Loke abhija is a synonym for the first hindrance. First hindrance, karma chanda, it usually is in Pali. And uh, the second hindrance is usually domanas is usually uh, domanas domanasa, but in this particular case, I don't know. The second hindrance is a white a white but it's also domanasa in two suttas. So these are synonyms. They actually used alternatively. So this is why that when uh, the commentaries, which you know, give you some indication of what uh, is meant. When they say that those two words, Naloke Abhija stands for the first of the five hindrances and uh, Dhammanasa stands for the second of the five hindrances. So this is actually uh, uh, what the commentaries and what usually is meant uh, by the having restrained the five hindrances. It's talking about the five hindrances, to restrain them. And it makes so much sense because if you have the five hindrances very, very strong, then you can't be mindful of very much at all. It is those five hindrances which actually cloud the mind, which um, stop the uh, insight, the wisdom coming up, they weaken wind, uh, the weaken wisdom. So that's why it's consistent with the rest of the uh, teachings of the Buddha in the Sutta. The first part uh, very clearly means having restrained the five hindrances. That is what one is supposed to do first of all, and then you can have enough awareness of the four things here, the body, the experience, the mind and the mind objects. That comes after you've restrained the five hindrances. And how do you restrain the five hindrances? By all of the factors of the Eightfold Path which went before. You have like a, a right understanding, a right view. Now that gets you into the ballpark of what we're doing this for. Uh, and we also have the, the right motivation, where you're coming from, which is motivations, the three motivations of uh, uh, motivations of uh, uh, letting go, renunciation, kindness and gentleness. Those are the three motivations. So you're already, you're actually letting go, renouncing, being kind, being gentle, where you're coming from. That's Sama Sankhapa. If you can uh, always have a look at that later on, it's in the same, um, uh, the same document here, the word of the Buddha. So once you're coming from the right place, as Ajahn Chah always used to remind us, we meditate to let go, to abandon, to renounce, not to get more things. So it is by renouncing, that means and being kind, being gentle, that's where you restrain, you weaken the five hindrances. And then, also from that, we have 
uh, the, uh, the Right Speech Act on Livelihood, that also um, weakens the hindrances as well. We're not sort of going to the pub, you know, we're not going to uh, parties, you know, we're actually restraining just um, the hindrances of wanting and ill will and, you know, being more calm and the efforts there, or rather the motivations, uh, which is the fact which precedes this one, that also calms everything down. So those first six factors of the Eightfold Path, they have the, one of the purposes of them is having to restrain the five hindrances, to calm you down enough so that when you do start doing the Satipatthana, you know, your not, sort of mind is not running all over the place. You know, you are clear, energized, you know exactly what this is supposed to be doing. So that means you've got the groundwork. It is just like uh, uh, preparing the earth you know, before you plant the, the vegetables. So having restrained the five hindrances. And having restrained the five hindrances, if you look at any of the, the commentaries here, you see that's exactly what they say as well. Restrain the five hindrances. And you abide aware of these things. And you can't be really be aware if those five hindrances are strong. If you've got so much like lust or wanting, you know, your mindfulness is out there somewhere, the object of what you want. Or if you, you know, get angry and upset at somebody, again, you're not really being aware of what's happening to you when you get you know, mad with rage or negativity. And of course, those also just weaken the mind's strength. You haven't got much energy because that drains the body. You know, negativity uh, gives you a big boost of energy, but once that goes, you're really uh, very... Um, uh, very weak in your mental energies. And uh, so that's where one gets the, uh, the sloth and torpor and the restlessness from. And so all of those things, especially those first four hindrances, you can see that that is what actually stops you being mindful. So you restrain the five hindrances first of all to get some mindfulness going. It's not overcoming those five hindrances, it's restraining them enough to be mindful and after the mindfulness, the stillness of samadhi and the stillness of samadhi is what suppresses the five hindrances for many, many, many hours. So this is where we restrain the five hindrances first of all. Energized, knowing the purpose of what you are doing. And the purpose of what you are doing here is again um, going to be explained uh, in a few moments, just so we know what these four things are. You know, the four uh, focuses here is the body, is the experience itself, the mind and the mind objects, and especially like the body, to realize that that body, you know, has nothing to do with you. It is just a vehicle, so you, know, you don't have too much concern about this body. Look after it, care for it, just like you would a car, but you know, you don't just go uh, berserk or ballistic, you know, when somebody scratches your car. You know, it's just bodies being the body. You understand what the body is, its limitations. You don't get upset with the body, and also you don't. One body is enough. You don't go looking for another body to share. And the experience. This is a a translation which you know I'm pretty much sticking to these days. Usually they call Vedana the quality of the experiences. The the um, effective quality, whether it's happiness, sadness, or in between, pleasure, pain, or in between. And to me, that is just uh, like saying there's you know, the different species of trees. But what we're talking about is like trees or plants. So I think I very on strong ground here to say the second uh, focus of mindfulness is on experience. Now, your experience you're having right now what you experience. And of course the mind, the chitta, and that is the, the sixth of the, uh, of the um, senses. Just talking earlier with one of our uh, devoted uh, regular supporters and uh, Aristotle, I was quoting Aristotle, that uh, he always used to call the mind the sixth sense and that sixth sense he called was a common sense because it was common to the other five senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. And so, uh, whatever you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, then the mind can also pick up and know it. And uh, it's also 
um, somehow or other got lost in Western civilization. It's always been there in the East. And this is one of the reasons it's called you know, materialism now in philosophy. Just, you know, just the, the five senses, the body stuff, and no recognition of sort of the, the mental world. So I always say that that's one of the reasons for the problems and difficulties which uh, people have in the West, because over those centuries we've lost our mind, literally, and we've abandoned our common sense. That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> So anyway, that's the mind and the mind objects. I'll come across that later on. So anyway, straight away, it's not what uh, you might have read before, which is brilliant because the whole point of having a class here is not to tell you what you already know, that will just make you fall asleep, is to take it further. Any questions about that so far? Yes. The five hindrances. These are, uh, it's this, what distorts your uh, perception and cognition. In other words, you see what you want to see and you block out what you don't want to see. That's aversion and uh, wanting. Those are the first two. So it's, this is the nature of human beings uh, the classic story, which I come across again, is that when you fall in love, when you fall in love, your partner is the most beautiful person in the whole world and you wonder how lucky you are that she also loves you and you can't see anything wrong in her at all, or him. Uh, just the way she picks her nose is just so cute. <laughs> but, usually after one or two years, <laughs> you say, what the heck did I do marrying that? <laughs> and same person, and that person could be you. <laughs> so what's going on there? Is because that's what sort of love does. It's the, it is an illusion. It is, you see what you want to see. <laughs> and when you get out of love, especially when you get angry, go to divorce courts. <laughs> then again, because you're angry, you see all the faults in the other person. So, you know, which is actually true? Which is whatever you wish to focus on. And it becomes just, there's these hindrances. You're not seeing what's really there. You're seeing what you want to see or you're blocking off, you know, what you don't want to see. That's, you know, that sort of attachment type of love. Not the other type of love, which is opening the door of your heart to someone, whatever they do, however they are. And so that is those likes and dislikes. Makes us only not see the truth, but see what we want to see. And then of course, because of that, the poor old mind gets um, so um, tired, wanting stuff and opposing stuff. That's where it gets lost and torpor from. You know, the tiredness of the mind. Just to be able just to sit still and let things be is you know, very difficult for people. But that's one of the reasons why when you meditate, you let things be, you don't fight, you, know, you don't want, you don't give up not wanting. You just restrain those five hindrances and you get very still and your energies come up again. You know, you're actually no sloth and torpor anymore. And, but you're bright. But it's not coming from the willpower, it's what creates restlessness. So, you know, these, when we make peace with things, make peace, be kind, be gentle, you find the five hindrances get suppressed. So you're not fighting the world, which means you get energized. You know sloth and torpor, but not restless either. And you're seeing what's right there, rather than what you want to see. So this is actually where the five hindrances are exactly what um, suppresses wisdom, what stops you being still. And of course, the one I missed out, the doubt, skeptical doubt, that is because, you know, one doesn't know exactly where one is going, what one is doing. And sometimes it takes a little bit of trust or experience to understand that how to overcome that doubt, and how one overcomes that doubt. Enough awareness, you know that this is moving in a good direction, you're getting more peaceful. It seems to be working. You're more peaceful, less tiredness, less restlessness, you're in the middle there somewhere. 
this beautiful clarity, energy, but which is still. So that's roughly the five hindrances in, in brief. But all we say here is that those are what stops you being still, what stops you being wise, the hindrances. So one has to sort of, uh, has to um, calm them down first of all, which to me that's the job of the, the earlier factors of the Eightfold Path, just to restrain them. And then one can be uh, clear enough to actually to take it deeper and to understand, become still, and then become incredibly mindful so one can uh, see what was the problem in the first place. I don't know if that answers the question, sort of. Okay. Anyway, that's the translation there. Having restrained the five hindrances, you abide aware of the body, Vedana, experience, mind, and mind objects. And that is standard in commentarial Buddhism. And it makes sense according as justified with the, from the suttas. So how are you aware of the body? So there are many different exercises here. And the first one is mindfulness of breathing, anapanasati. You go to a quiet, secluded place, sit down comfortably and give priority to establishing mindfulness. Then mindful, you breathe in, mindful, you breathe out. When the in-breath and out-breath are long, you are aware that they are long. When the in-breath and out-breath are short, you are aware that they are short. Then you learn to experience the hold of the breath as you breathe in and out. Then you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out. Just as a skilled painter is aware whether they are making a long brush stroke or a short brush stroke, so too when the in-breath is long, you are aware that it is long. Dot, dot, dot. In this way, you are aware of your own body, or you are aware that the bodies of others are the same nature as yours, or you abide aware of the nature of both your own and others' bodies, or else you abide aware of what causes the arising of the body, the four nutriments, and those four nutriments, you know, later on we're going to uh, mention those, are uh, uh, fish and chips. Oh no, sorry, just that's material. <laughs> food, <laughs> cups of tea, <laughs> that's only messing around, sorry. The four nutriments are physical food and it's uh, contact, sensory experience uh, and also the consciousness and will. Those are the four sort of nutriments which keep you know, your body going and it's just that is just very easy to understand because if you don't have any physical food, you run out of that, of course you can't sustain this body, it's got no gas, no fuel keeping it going, physical fuel. And then also the no, no passa, no contact, no physical, no, no um, sensory experience. Which is one of the reasons why if someone is in a coma, you know, just touch them, talk to them, contact them if you want them to actually to, to come out. That, because without that physical experience, that sensory experience, of course, you know, they just, there's nothing actually to keep them in this body. And also you have the, the will to live, which is you know, quite sort of common, people have seen that. People you know, in hospital, they are about to sort of pass away and they seem to not really be dying at all until some relation comes. They keep themselves alive through will. And you know, up to a point, obviously. And the last one is consciousness. When consciousness, stream of consciousness departs the body, then the body passes away. So this is you aware that this body is just caused. And once that uh, cause is taken away, so does the body pass away. You're aware that... Uh, where, where, where I got to? What causes the rising of the body? You abide that the body will cease when the four nutriments cease, or you abide contemplating the body's causal nature of both arising and ceasing, or else mindfulness is just a body. Impermanent suffering, not me, not mine, not a permanent essence, is established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom, essential for liberation. And you abide independent, not clinging to anything in this world. Now that's a little standard there. Uh, especially with the mindfulness of breathing, you go to a quiet, secluded place, sit down comfortably. Now, first of all, yes, it is possible if you have some training to sit anywhere 
to watch the breath. But you know, it's like uh, uh, if you start to learn how to drive a car, you know, it's much better to do that in secluded, quiet streets. You know, when you're not going to get people booping their horns at you all the time and giving you two fingers or one finger in Australia. So in other words, you know, you go to a place where you can learn the basics of meditation and then later on you can meditate anywhere. But first of all, you go to a quiet, secluded place, sit down comfortably. Now, there's many things here which uh, I have uh, translated and of course those of you who have listened to this class before notice that I translate the phrases, not the words, the unit which you should always translate is a phrase, never a word. Because if you translate words, that's when you get the old saying of, of it rained cats and dogs. And that's a stupid translation, it just means it rained heavily. You never see cats and dogs coming from the sky in a thunderstorm. What it means is it's an idiom. So we always translate the idiom, get the meaning of you know the phrase. And so, uh, you sit down comfortably. It did say in the, those days, you sit down cross-legged, keeping your back erect. However, for many people, that, <laughs> that will cause you intense pain. <laughs> and also, it will not cause you any, any ability to be able to watch the breath. In other words, that was just the idiom of learning how to sit down comfortably. Sometimes you have, need to sit in a chair or need to you know, sit with your back against a wall with many, many different cushions. Fine. The whole point there is so the body is comfortable. And you give priority to establishing mindfulness. And the usual translation, you, uh, you uh, focus, you establish mindfulness in front of you. And of course that means that many people think you have to watch the tip of your nose. And of course, those of you who haven't seen this before, that if I focus on the tip of my nose and I will keep my eyelids open, if I try focusing on the tip of my nose, what would happen is my eyes would also go to the tip of the nose and I become cross-eyed. That's what actually happens to people if you peel their eyelids back when they're meditating and focusing on the tip of the nose, automatically uh, their mind, their eyes go to what their mind is looking at and so they get these tension headaches across their um, their head, their forehead and that's why many people would complain to me the first time I went to Malaysia of Samadhi headache and I thought that's crazy, what are you doing? Because they're really focusing hard you know, on the tip of their nose, that's not what it means it means you give priority, put it number one on the list to get mindfulness really strong first of all and then once you have the mindfulness strong, then you can breathe in and out and notice the breath. If you try doing this when a person's mindfulness is still weak, you find they can't watch the breath. They, they go off somewhere because you haven't established, grounded your mindfulness strong enough yet to be able to do something like watching the breath. So this is where we say that the first thing you do, you use a quiet secluded place, sit down comfortably, give priority to creating mindfulness and you know that I usually uh, try to establish the mindfulness by present moment awareness and silence. The peace ometer, you know, comfortable, look at the peace ometer, get yourself calm and then you become aware of the breath pretty easily and comfortably too. So then you get mindfully breathe in, mindfully breathe out uh, when the in-breath and out-breath are long, you're aware they are long. The in-breath and out-breath are short, you're aware that they are short. In other words, you don't worry about controlling the breath. You just know, is it long, is it short? And there's many uh, different ways of fulfilling those two parts of the of Anapanasati. It is, uh, you don't have to breathe in a long breath and a short breath. Sometimes you can count the breath, one, two, three, four, five. Breathing in, five, four, three, two, one, breathing out. Or you can just uh, start breathing in peace, breathing out, let go. Or in Thai, breathe in, bud, breathe out, to. The buddho, buddho, buddho. There's so many ways of doing that, but the whole point is you give yourself some uh, extra uh, little, I, you know, I call it like a crutch, to be able to learn how to walk. 
Uh, it's a little extra thing so you can become aware of your breathing to the point that you can learn to experience a hold of the breath as you breathe in and out. And then you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out. So this is um, the first four steps of Anapanasati. And I did change the simile. They said like a lathe operator knows when you have a long pull or a short pull on the lathe. And of course um, that lathe is always electronic, automatic these days. I did have the opportunity in 43 years ago when we built a lathe, the old type of lathe with a, uh, a bamboo and string. And then it was short strokes, long strokes but people don't use that anymore, but certainly you've all done some painting. You know when it's a long brush stroke or a short brush stroke, that's what it means. So too when the in-breath is long, you are aware that it is long, when it's short, you know it's short. In this way, you're aware of your own body or the nature, or you're aware that the bodies of others are the same as yours, or you abide. What's the breath got to do with the body? And later on the Buddha said, now this is, we call that the body is just, uh, the breath is part of the body. It's just one way of getting this body awareness. So when you understand that this is part of your body, the breathing, that comes up later on uh, when uh, the, uh, we talk about Anapanasati, which comes later on in the word of the Buddha, you see the Buddha specifically said, I call the breath as part of the body. And so this is one of the reasons why um, it counts as uh, the body awareness, the first of the Satipatthana. But the whole point of it is that you know, you're aware of bodies, what they are like, that you know, they are not under your control, they are just uh, come from nutriments, from causes, uh, they cease, and it's just a body, that's all impermanent suffering, not me, not mine, not a permanent essence, is established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness of wisdom, essential for liberation. That is one way you are mindful of the body. Any comments on that? Questions? So one thing here is, in the Anapanasati Sutta, this is Satipatthana Sutta, Anapanasati Sutta, it actually, maybe actually, it's further down here, let's go off to that one. It's on page... Uh, it's, it's, here we go. Uh, on page 44, can you scroll down? From, you got that one? Imagine 118, mindfulness of breathing completes the four focuses of mindfulness. There may be different pages on you, on your one, but it's summary of the Satipatthana, the end of the Satipatthana. It's only a couple of pages down. Nibbana through Anapanasati. Well, I'll just read it out anyway, while you're looking for it. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And you go to the paragraph, mindfulness of breathing completes the four focuses of mindfulness. And how does mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated complete the four focuses of mindfulness? When the in-breath and out-breath are long and you're aware that they are long, when the in-breath and out-breath are short and you're aware that they are short, when you learn to experience the whole of the breath as you breathe in and out, when you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out, on those occasions you are mindful of the body, having restrained the five hindrance, hindrances energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. In and out breathing is regarded by the Buddha as a body in the category bodies. That is why on that occasion a meditator abides mindfulness of the body, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. So this is actually where uh, the Buddha is actually saying that watching the breath is watching the body. So that's one of the first ways, and one of the most common ways of uh, doing the first focus of mindfulness. And the second way, the four postures, yeah, 
the four postures. You got back down there, good. When walking, you are aware in the present that I am walking. When standing, sitting, lying down, you are aware in the present that I am lying down. Thus you maintain present moment awareness however your body is disposed. In this way, you are aware of your own body, you are aware that the bodies of others are the same as yours, you abide aware of both your own and others' bodies, or else you abide aware of what causes the arising of the body, the four nutriments we have, or you abide aware the body will cease when the four nutriments cease, or you abide contemplating the body's cause or nature of both arising and ceasing, or mindfulness, it is just a body established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom essential for liberation. And you abide in the pet and not clinging to anything in the world. This is another way you are mindful of the body. So here the mindfulness, stressing the point it's in the present moment, you are just knowing what you are doing. So instead of actually going somewhere, you are being here. And that way that you have the opportunity to actually to know how your body is disposed, now how it's, now what posture it's in, and that gives you a way of being mindful of the body to the point that instead of looking for something else, going somewhere else, you can actually be here and understand how this body works. Basically it's not yours. I don't know if any of you have sometimes been meditating and you, maybe your arm lifts up or you twist around and it's totally, it hasn't been done by you. Or if you've ever gone for long walks and certainly um, happened to me from going for long walks and even more so when you're doing walking meditation after a while you get into a routine and you know you don't do the walking anymore it's like you're sitting there or standing there or sorry walking and you're just um, the body's doing the walking and you don't tell the body to move you don't tell the leg to sort of walk you're just it's doing it by itself you're on autopilot it is that phenomena which was used to be noticed by um, soldiers who used to march instead of going in trucks well they could march all night and some of those soldiers would be fast asleep but they'll still be marching basically after a while just you get into this this rut and the, the legs keep on moving and you don't actually give them any orders anymore they just keep carrying on you're aware you're not sort of sleepwalking but it's Half, half. It's, you're aware of what's going on, but you're not giving any orders, just the body keeps on doing the, the walking. It's really cool when you have those experiences. It shows you that you know, you're not really in control. And of course, as any doctor knows, there's so much of your body anyway, which is on automatic, you know, breathing, heartbeat, and so many other stuff which you don't really know about. And that just is, uh, shows that it's just the body, it's just the body, it breathes by itself, and whatever posture you're in, it's just the body is pretty automatic. Comments? Okay. Full comprehension of the purpose. You act in full comprehension of the purpose when going forward and returning. You act in full comprehension of the purpose when looking ahead and looking away, when flexing and extending your limbs, when wearing your clothes and carrying things. In the original it said when wearing your robes and carrying your bowl. But this is supposed to apply to everybody, not just monks. And I've never seen many of you wearing robes, and you don't carry bowls, but whatever you're carrying things, it's make it sort of uh, irrelevant to everybody. You act in full comprehension of the purpose regarding eating, drinking, defecating, urinating, walking, standing, sitting, sleeping, being awake, talking, and keeping silent. Why are you doing this? In this way, you're aware of your own body, where the bodies of others in the same nature as yours, or you abide aware of both your own and others' bodies, or else you abide aware of what causes the arising of the body, the four nutriments. It's another way of like looking at the body and understanding it. Or else mindful, it's just a body, that's all. Impermanent suffering, not me, not mine, and not a permanent essence, is established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom essential for liberation. And you abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world. The bodily parts. You review your body from head to toe, bounded by skin, as made up of many kind of parts, blood and bones, tissues and organs, just as though were a full shopping bag with many kind of groceries, such as bread, potatoes, fruit and vegetables. So too you review the same body as full of many parts as. In this body there are hairs, bones, shit and urine. This is another way you're mindful of the body. 
He put a little bit of a gross word in there just to get people's attention because sometimes people start falling asleep on a hot afternoon <laughs> when they've heard this before. <laughs> okay, I apologize to people who are offended. <laughs> But all it really means is don't go through every one of these, one after another, because that was just the way in the time of the Buddha that they understood the, you know, what the body is uh, composed of. And you may notice that in the original it says 31 parts of the body, but later on they realized they missed out, of the, missed out the brain. So you know, that, that's why in the commentaries they added the, the second part of the brain is number 32. The original was a no-brainer. <laughs> oh, come on, it's a hot afternoon. <laughs> but what it means, it doesn't matter, 31, 32, 33 or whatever. But the point is, it's just little parts. So you just look at this body, what actually is it? It's just different kinds of stuff. And in the original, it had the different types of rice. Okay, and so hill rice, red rice, paddy rice, I don't know what else other rice there was. But you know, here you say shopping bag with different types of groceries, which is what I'm trying to do here is like keep the essence of the simile but make it a little bit more understandable. Or elements, you review your body by way of elements, thus in this body there are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element. This is another way you are mindful of the body. And of course I resisted that as a, a physicist before because two of those especially, the fire element and the, uh, the, the air element, the fire was was heat and air was vibration, they were one of both the same. But it's just one way of just splitting up this thing which we call stuff into different, um, uh, different elements. But you know, just when you split them up into its parts, you realize there's uh, nothing much there. All the nine charnel ground contemplations. And it's amazed just sometimes how people really get into this stuff. You see a corpse thrown aside in the charnel ground, up to three days old, bloated, livid and oozing matter. Then you reflect your own body is the same nature, it may become like that, it's not exempt from that fate. You know, sometimes, it's amazing, some monks you know, need to go and see a psychologist sometimes because they start to say, oh you see a corpse thrown aside in the charnel ground, being devoured by birds, animals or maggots. <laughs> <laughs> you don't do that, it's just seeing the nature of a body. Uh, then you reflect your own body is the same nature, it may become like that, it's not exempt from that fate. You see a corpse thrown aside in a china ground, a skeleton with flesh blood held together with sinews, fleshless skeleton smeared with blood held together with sinews, a skeleton without flesh and blood held together with sinews, disconnected bones scattered in all directions, bones bleached white, the colour of shells, bones heaped up, Bones more than a year old rotten and crumbled to dust. You reflect that your own body is of the same nature, it may become like that, is not exempt from that fate. And I think you're getting the, the message here, which I hope the purpose of this is just so you can see it's just a body that sort. Nothing to really get too attached to. And it's really quite surprising that sometimes when people see a dead body, Actually, it's very hard to see a dead body. If there's ever an accident, straight away someone throws a white cloth over it on the side of the road. If it's a road accident or any other sort of a tragedy where people get killed. And sometimes, you know, we're not allowed to see dead bodies. And even it's a great privilege sometimes to be able to you know, have the opportunity to actually to see and touch something which is dead especially a, a body. I remember many times in the funerals which I went to over in Thailand, you know, there was no sort of formaldehyde, no sort of um, making sort of uh, the body look really nice. It was just really down to earth and for some visitors it's the first time they've ever seen a body or touched it or felt it, what it's like to have a dead body. And actually it takes away a lot of the, the attachments to a body. Even better that we did have the opportunities even early here in Perth of going to the, the mortuary, you know, the coroner at that time was a neighbour of uh, Dennis Shepherd, so we had permission to go in there and actually you know, see an autopsy. And it was just a wonderful thing to be able to see, that's just my body, your body, all the same. You can't say it's beautiful, or it's attractive, or it's ugly, it's just a body, that's all. It's wonderful to be able to see that. And what that means is it takes away the, the attachment 
to a body. It's just a body, that's all. Yeah. Ah, oh, okay. It's, you have to have the attachment in order to be alive. It's differentiating caring from actually like, like owning. So, you know, you, you know, you have a car. You know, you're going to have to let that go sometimes. You know, you're going to have to, um, it's going to uh, get so old sooner or later. You know, you have to, it won't pass any tests. It's not roadworthy anymore. And you get rid of it. But, you know, the, you, you don't keep going for too long. You care for it, but you don't own it too much. So the difference between care and owning like the owning of a body and identifying with a body is just when you know people wear get Botox nose jobs. When you see sort of you know people who used to be really really beautiful and fit, you know trying to fake it. You know all these old film stars, you know were attractive in their use and wear so much makeup that you know it's quite sad. And there's nothing wrong with being old. If you can allow that to happen, you don't have to keep dyeing your hair. I don't. <laughs> so, all he's saying is just, you know, just, you know, you understand what this body really is and you don't try and uh, expect from it what it so will never be able to give you. So you care for it, but you don't obsess about it. You don't own it. So when it's ready to, to be replaced, then you let it go. You don't keep clinging on to life, you know, when it's, you know, your part are used by date. So anyway, you, it's just a body, it's impermanent. It's, and this way you're aware of your own body, you're aware the bodies of others are the same as yours, you abide aware of both your own and others' bodies. Or else you abide aware of what causes the arising of the body, just these nutriments to keep a body going, what really causes it to continue, again, is your food. Is also the, um, the uh, experience. That's why sometimes when people just um, get very old and they stay in their beds, they don't get up, they don't have any contact, they don't have any stimulation, you can see it's like a slow death. They don't have like this contact, this experience, you know, to actually to stimulate them. And that's why sometimes you can see that people who do work with people with Alzheimer's or dementia, you know, something which stimulates them, just like you know, like a dance or old music. People really get sort of lively and that sort of stimulates them. They get some contact which you know gets them alive. And also the um, the will as well, the will to live which is really important, and also the, you know, when it's consciousness there, the consciousness leaves and they're gone. And so, uh, you understand you know, the, the, what causes the, the body, uh, you're by contemplating the, what causes the arising of the body, you're by where the body is the nature to cease, where the four nutriments cease, you're by contemplating the body's cause or nature of both arising and ceasing, or else my it's just a body, Impermanent suffering, not me, not mine, not a permanent essence is established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom, essential for liberation. So you can let it go, but you still care for it. Care for it, but be able to understand that one day it's going to go. And your body independent, not clinging to anything in the world. It's one way you're mindful of the body. There's some benefits. When mindfulness of the body has been repeatedly practiced and developed, these benefits uh, will can be expected. You overcome delight and discontent. Because this delight and discontent, mostly about bodily stuff, you know, just how uh, beautiful you are, how thin you are, or discontent that you're too fat, or... <laughs> In other words, uh, much of the stuff which you know, people just worry about is body stuff. You overcome fear and dread, you can bear cold, heat, hunger and thirst, contact with flies, mosquitoes, ticks, wind, the sun, creeping things. You enjoy unwelcome words and arisen bodily feelings that are painful and menacing to life. 
because it's your body, it's not you. It's this body doing its stuff. Now what is really, and I guess interesting, you experience whenever needed, without difficulty, the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and provide a pleasant abiding in this very life. And the reason for that is because the jhanas happen when you can let go of the body and its five senses. The jhana is just, you know, when the body is just not important to you anymore, you can let it go. And I often uh, focus on this point, that one of the reasons why people can get pretty still, but they can't get fully still enough to let the body go, because they're afraid of letting the body go. They are attached to the body. Because to be able to let the body go, the five senses which protect the body, you know, the hearing. If I don't keep my hearing intact, somebody's going to creep up on me and who knows what they're going to do with my body. If I, my physical feelings are disappearing, like that Singaporean man years ago, he said, ah, I can't meditate anymore. My hands were disappearing. Say, so that's, yeah, that's only the start of it, mate. More things are going to disappear. And it's great to have all these things disappear. But why can't we let it go? When the process is happening, why do we interfere and stop with it? It's the fear, and fear is always losing something which we're attached to, which we haven't seen before. In this particular case, we're attached to our body. We just won't let it go. So a little by little, when you do the body awareness, you know, it's just a body, that's all, so you can actually let it disappear. And that's when your attachment to the body, which disappeared, at least you know, it's gone for a little while, that is when the jhanas become uh, easy. And because of the jhanas, the people really get into this sort of stuff. And then you can wield the various kind of supernormal power. Interested? <laughs> Having been one, you can become many. Having been many, you can become one. You appear and vanish. You go unhindered through a wall or through a mountain, as through space. You dive in and out of the earth as though it were water. You walk on water without sinking as though it were the earth. Sitting cross-legged, you travel in space like a bird. You wield bodily mastery as far as even the Brahma world, the God world. Why is it only as far as the Brahma world? Because that's the limit of the uh, the, the, uh, the five sense world, that's Rupa, that's um, Karma Loka. Beyond then is the, the jhana worlds. With clear audience and divine ear you can hear sounds both heavenly and human that are far as well as near. You can read the minds of other persons having compassed them with your own mind, especially whether the mind is affected by one of the five hindrances or whether it's experiencing a jhana. You can recollect your past lives, even up to a hundred thousand births and many eons of expanding universes and decaying universes. There I was so named as such a family, with such appearance, such was my food, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my lifetime and passing away from there I appeared in this other place. And there too, ah, I was so named of such a family, such my lifetime and passing away from there I reappeared here. Thus with their aspects and particulars you recollect many of your past lives. With the clairvoyance and divine eye you see beings pass away and reappearing in fear and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. One understands how beings are reborn according to their actions, their karma. And most important benefit number 10, by realizing for yourself with direct experience in this very life, you enter upon the by the deliverance of mind, the little, little, little deliverance by wisdom, you are an enlightened one. So that's, by the Buddha, the benefits of the mindfulness of the body, basically, so you can let go of concern of the body, and just put your energy focus on the, the importance of the mind. And that means that uh, you get jhanas, and you get supernormal powers. Interested? Why? <laughs> because and people say, well, have you ever seen psychic powers? Say, of course, you know, as a monk. But there's a problem there. Because just like um, uh, even Devadatta, 
you know, got some psychic powers and thought he was the equivalent of a Buddha. You saw something very similar in my first year as a monk in Thailand, where there was one monk who, you know, stated he could hear, you know, conversations which were happening about six miles away. And they checked him out, it was true. You know, he had this amazing, this clear audience. And as a result of that, that, you know, one day he thought, you know, he was uh, as good as Ajahn Chah and sat in Ajahn Chah's chair, you know, in Wat Pa Pong. And, you know, Ajahn Chah was really skillful, just, you know, come over here. And the next day he bowed to every monk, you know, in the monastery, and then he departed, never saw him again. Don't know where he went to. But, you know, realized that his attainment, like Devadatta's, had caused him to get a bit too too proud, I thought it was his attainment. But those things sometimes do happen, you know, the reading minds and stuff. But, as I tell people, that, you know, if you read one person's mind, you know, you don't need to be afraid because people's minds are not interesting enough to read. You know, it's just like reading a sort of a pulp fiction, a trash novel. Now, honestly, you know, <laughs> is your mind ready to be read? So anyone who can do that, just do it once or twice for fun, never do it again. <laughs> Waste of time. <laughs> yes, go on. Um, before we go too far, I just want to go back um, to the hindrances. Um, oh, yeah. When we have doubt, what's the difference between, this is the part I'm not quite sure, the, yeah. that sort of doubt and the doubt the person entering into the stream winner or doubt overcomes. Well, what's the difference in the doubt Ah, okay. The, the difference in those, uh, in the, you know, the doubt of like, which is overcome with a stream winner, you know, is, you know, on the teachings of the Buddha, especially the core teachings, you know, of, um, there's nothing in here, you know, like of uh, uh, no me, no my, not a self, are these um, things which we take to be me, the body, you know, the first of the candors, and just the experience, you know, the second of the five candors, the five components of existence, and you know, the will, you know, and this the mind, all of these things there's nothing to do with me, there's nothing no essential essence in there. So if you've seen that for yourself, then you know there's no doubt anymore. But to be able to see that for yourself is seeing something which, you know, will always again shock you to the core, turn you over, it's not what you expect. Doesn't matter how many times you know people teach about non-self, you know that there's no one in here that you know that you didn't decide to ask that question. You know it was already sort of uh, conditioned. You always assume that you're in control of your body and your speech and your mind and stuff like that. And to actually, when you start to talk about even like the the consciousness is just a process. It's not a being inside there. You know which is like a person. On the computer screen, on the uh, the mouse, clicking this and clicking that, deciding what to do. When you find out the driverless bus is no actually driver in that bus, all of those things, you know, actually shock you. It's not what you expect. So you know the that is where your doubts are overcome when those experiences happen to you, and you realise, my goodness, you know what the Buddha was saying here. You know, is something I've seen for myself. So that's where the doubt disappears, and it replaced by confidence. This Buddha knows exactly what he's talking about. Even actually yesterday somebody was asking about the uh, going for refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. They can understand a bit about the Dhamma and the Sangha, but about the Buddha. You know, how can you actually have real confidence in the Buddha, real refuge in the Buddha? And you know, the answer is that when you've seen the Dhamma and the Sangha, Know well, the purpose of it, and you know what it really means when you become a stream winner. That's where your your uh, confidence becomes solid. And that's where you can go to refuge in the Buddha. You know what you're taking refuge really in. The one who sees the Buddha sees the Dhamma. The one who sees the Dhamma sees the Buddha. You understand what that really means. So that's actually you know, where the doubt disappears. The stream winning. This over here is restraining the doubt, suppressing it for a little while, 
So it gives you the opportunity to be still enough to actually to overcome the doubt once and for all. Making sense? So, so, um, so, so if you're quite aware at the time of death, then after death, that's why you bec could become a stream winner because you could see the body, it's gone, nothing to do with me. Is that right? Exactly, that's a, that's a powerful point. That you know, sometimes people think, oh, you know, I want to be a stream winner, uh, but they find it hard to let go. <laughs> but uh, you know, when you're dying and the death process, you know, things are taken away from you. You know, whether you like it or not. You know, this body is seen, it doesn't belong to you. You know, it's an obvious thing. And also that at that time, you know, you have an opportunity to, to totally, or at least let go enough to become the stream winner. It's not me, not mine, not a self, and this body is not me, not mine, not, not a self. The experience is always changing. So much you can actually see, even this, this jitter, this mind. You, know, you can see that that just comes and goes as well. So the, the death moment is a very important part, uh, not a very uh, possible part if you have not um, uh, seen the Dharma before, now you can you know, very easily see it. If you've just got the background, the basis, you know, to letting go. Now one of the things which most people actually say that uh, in the dying process, that when you are past the the point of no return and you, you know, you've left the body, it's just so peaceful, so free, so wonderful. And why is it so peaceful? Because a lot of suffering has disappeared. The suffering of having a body, of having five senses, is gone. So that, you know, if one can look at it in the right way, you've had some teachings before which can point you in the right direction, then you've got a chance of seeing these things which I thought belonged to me and which were pleasurable, they now disappeared. Oh, how wonderful that is. Okay. Okay, now there's a little part here. Arising and passing away, rise and fall. Um, Sometimes that uh, people ask the questions about uh, rise and fall, rise and fall, what does it really mean? Because you see here in each one of these uh, Satipatthana, you are a, a, or else you abide aware of what causes the arising of the b body, uh, you ab abide aware the bodies of nature to cease, or you abide contemplating the bodies arising and, and ceasing. And what does that actually really mean? And this is where we quote from the Satipatthana Samyutta. What does it mean by the arising and passing away, the rise and fall? I will teach you the origi origination and the passing away of the four focuses of mindfulness. Supported by the four nutriments, there is the origination and continuance of the body. And with the cessation of the four nutriments, the body ceases. And the four nutriments are Food, the six sense contacts, the passa, will and consciousness. Supported by the six sense contacts, contacts uh, there is the origination of experience, the Svedana. With the cessation of the six uh, sense contacts, experience ceases. So this is the second Satipatthana. Supported by Nama Rupa, which in brief means the objects of consciousness, there's the origination of the jitta. With the cessation of Nama Rupa, the jitta ceases. Supported by attention, there's the origination of mind objects. With the cessation of attention, the mind objects cease. So what we're saying here, that each one of these, it's not just seeing them rise and fall, rise and fall, it's actually seeing them come into existence and pass away totally. It's not just seeing, say, the third satipatthana, the jitta, the mind, just you know, come and change. It's actually seeing the whole thing disappear. And the simile which I often use, it's not just seeing the programs on the TV change, it's seeing the whole TV set vanish, which you know is very confronting. 
It's not supposed to happen like that. He's watching a TV and the whole thing, the whole set vanishes. This is what we call like ceasing, rising and passing away. Seeing things come and go, that's obvious. But seeing things arise and then cease totally, and that is weird. So this is with each one of these things. That's what it means by rise and fall. They, they have a cause, and when the cause is taken away, it vanishes. And that goes with experience, goes with the mind, goes with the mind objects. And that's where you can tie that in with the other great suttas, such as the Agiwachagota Sutta, where the Buddha you know, compared this chitta like a flame. And it's actually the, what uh, he really said in there was a, a fire. And the fire is dependent upon the fuel. When the fuel is burnt out, the fire disappears. And that's when, so, but where does it go to? Does it go to the north, east, south, west, up or down? It doesn't go anywhere, it just vanishes, that's all. And that's where, you know, I just um, use that same simile and with good ground because this is also part of the enlightenment experience of uh, Patachara. And uh, she, uh, again, was looking at a flame, a candle flame, actually an oil lamp flame, and a, uh, a gust of wind blew the flame out. And what was the flame there anyway? It was just three causes. The flame depended upon the oil, the wick, and the heat. And when one of those was removed, in this particular case the heat, because the wind blew the heat away, then the flame stopped, disappeared, vanished. And the word for that, as you should all know by now if you've been paying attention, the word for its ceasing is nibbanad. That's the way they used to say when a flame stops, it nibbanas. So this is actually where you can see that when we see the causal factor of this body, and it's just a process, it's not a thing which has you know, a permanent essence. Experience is not a thing. It comes and goes. You see its causes, when the causes are taken away, the experience stops. And when the mind has its causes, the objects of consciousness, when they stop, the mind stops. And also the mind objects. When the cause stops, they stopped. So this is why we have the cause and effect. Notice the causes, and you see there's nothing really there, just like a flame. That's why you can always say that somehow, I don't know how he managed to do this, Elton John had, must have had some knowledge of the Dhamma when he wrote, Flame in the Wind. I've never heard that, but apparently he's a flame in the wind. It's supposed to be a good song. A candle in the wind. Shows you how, you know, I'm actually being honest here. I haven't heard that. But candle in the wind. Okay. So you must have got that from the, the Buddhist text. Do you reckon? <laughs> I don't know. Sorry? <laughs> he might. Anyway, here we go. Mindfulness of experience. How are you mindful of experience, Vedana? With a pleasant experience, you're mindful you feel a pleasant experience. When feeling an unpleasant experience, you're mindful you feel an unpleasant experience. When feeling a neutral experience, you're mindful you feel a neutral experience. When feeling a worldly pleasant experience, a worldly unpleasant, or a worldly neutral experience, you're mindful that you feel such a worldly pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral experience. When feeling an unworldly pleasant, unpleasant or neutral experience, you are mindful that you feel such an unworldly pleasant, unpleasant or neutral experience. In that way, you are aware of your own experience, Vedana. Are you aware that the experience of others is of the same nature of yours? Or you abide mindful of both your own and others' experience? Or else you abide aware of what causes the arising of experience? Sensory contact. We abide aware that experience is the nature to cease, when the sensory contact ceases, you abide contemplating experiences, cause or nature, both arising and ceasing. Or else mindfulness, that is just experience, impermanent suffering, not me, not mine, not a permanent essence, is established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom essential to liberation. And you abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world, not clinging to experience, 
not expecting what experience will never give you. That is how a meditator abides mindful of experience. The difference between a worldly and an unworldly uh, experience, Vedana, you have the worldly pleasurable experiences. Uh, those are things which are not going to be conducive actually to freedom and liberation, but the unworldly pleasant experiences are, such as inspiration. When you hear a really good Dhamma talk, when you see that there is a possibility for freedom, when you can see there's an ending of things, not continuing. This is uh, especially the joys of meditation, the joys of letting go. It's unworldly because it's lessening your attachment and, and entanglement in this world. This is the, why we call it an unworldly pleasant experience. What about an unworldly, unpleasant experience? What would that be? Oh, you know all this question. <laughs> okay, go on. Could be the ending of the jhana. The ending of the jhanas? An unworldly, unpleasant experience. <laughs> you reckon? I think it's understanding that this is the nature of dukkha rising, dukkha passing away. So you understand just where you. You, what's happened to you, uh, that you're stuck in this prison, at least you have some wisdom what's going on. But it's not something which is going to keep you in there forever, it's almost like a Nibida experience, where you see there's a problem, yes, you're being honest, there's a problem, but you see there's, that problem is going to lead to a way out. It's a suffering which leads to the end of suffering. But anyway, it's, it's just experience is all. And especially the reason why you have the pleasant, unpleasant and um, in-between experiences is to know that that is the nature of everybody's life and unfortunately you can't do much about it. Just talking with someone, uh, I think yesterday it's a very old uh, experiment which is done when people um, say you, you finish your uh, work and, and you're uh, on holiday or you retire you get a spike in happiness, but then you come back down again. You have a great sickness, you know, you've overcome cancer, yay! And you get so much happiness, but then you come down to the median level again. So in other words, people think you win the lottery, well yeah, I don't need to go to work anymore. But then, you know, it comes down again. So you have these spikes in happiness, but then it always comes down to the, the old median level again. It's not really sustainable. So you cannot have sort of the idea of permanent happiness. Sometimes it's not just sensory experience, but it's also understanding that that sensory experience has to change to be noticed. So you can't have a heaven where everything is happy ever after. If it's happy ever after, then you wouldn't notice it anymore. That's why it was Saint Augustine who said that you have to have at least one day every year in Christian heaven when you go down to hell. Otherwise you wouldn't experience what heaven was. Or just like during a range retreat when somebody was getting bored, at, so this is a lay meditator at Jana Grove, and he said, I'm really getting bored, meditation's not working. I sent him to Armadal shopping centre to get something for me and then he realized what a heaven <laughs> Jhana Gro was. <laughs> so it is the old thing that you know the extent of the happiness is actually dependent upon the suffering which went before. And the suffering is about the happiness you've lost. It's measured by what went before or what comes afterwards. Yeah, so I'm not sure what I'm trying to get across, but um, it's like when you pass over and the body's gone, all yeah. right, there is the essence within you. Ah. And, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, so 
I guess it would be part of the essence of belief systems as to where you either A might go or how you were feeling at the time when you pass over so that you um, disconnect from a lot. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yes, but... <laughs> yeah, go on then. <laughs> no, it's just that uh, we take with us, you know, when we um, die, we go through that process, you know, a lot of our perceptions, ideas, and that is why what fascinated me with accounts of people who have past life experiences, that, you know, how they react, you know, to the, the fact that, you know, they're they're different than what happened before, that you know, they have no physical pain, that they feel a lot of free, that joy which they have, that ease, that peace which they have, is the result of all that pain and suffering which they had before. You know, as an old person, sick person, a person who has been traumatized by some accident, it's like a whole burden of, of pain and problems is vanishing. But that's a spike of happiness then what happens next is really uh, important. That's many people, they, they go off to the light and you see what people come back and what they say. They come back and they say, well that was Jesus, that was pure love, if they were like a Christian. If they were a Catholic, they come back, it's Virgin Mary, she welcomed me and it was true. If they are sort of a, a uh, Mahayana Buddhist, it was the goddess of mercy, Kuan Yin, and they actually absolutely say they saw it, exactly. If they saw any angels, if they are Thai, they see the angels with the funny hats on. You know, it really depends on your culture, what you see. And interestingly, atheists, who don't believe in sort of a religion per se, they come back and say they saw Uncle George. <laughs> in other words, and sometimes you Listen to these accounts, what's actually going on there? And yeah, this is actually that, yeah, you know, you see something there, but it's how we color it in, it's how we perceive it. The perception is how we make what we expect to happen. If you've been, I'd say, a Thai or a, a um, say, a Cambodian, you've been in those temples and you've seen all of that since you were a kid. And if that's what you expect heavenly beings to look like, that's how you will perceive them. You know, if you're like a Westerner in the old days, you know, they all wear white clothes with a donut on top and just, you know, the little ring and wear have wings, that's how you will see them. It's amazing just how we see what we expect to see. And especially when we go to those states of that they literally are called mind made states. Manamaya Kaya. So there we can actually, just to see, just the way that we perceive is a lot to do with our conditioning, how we've expected to perceive. And if you follow a path which has a lot of fear and guilt, that's what you'll carry with you. Fear and guilt about things which you've done in the past. No one has you know, been absolutely perfect, which is why a lot of times people are terrified of death. I always say that imagine, you know, have you, have you ever gone to an examination, you're really afraid whether you're going to pass or you're going to fail? <laughs> could be like a, you know, a test or it could be like a driving exam or it could be like an English test, you know, if you, you, know, you do the, uh, um, for the permanent residence. Uh, are you afraid of that? That's not so bad because you can always do it again. But you know, the idea that you have one chance and that's it, heaven forever or hell forever, then that would just you know, make anybody pretty sort of anxious. Because no one is that perfect. They have no fear of judgment. Judgment day is coming, whatever. That's just so much fearful. But the idea of being able to let go, forgive, not carry around the past, not punish yourself for mistakes, but learn from mistakes. That type of freedom of forgiveness and always having a second chance, a third chance, many chances, that allows you to die much more peacefully, with far more anxiety, knowing that you can always do the test again. 
So things like that, it's just what we put into the dying process and a lot of that is our conditioning. You know, just our belief systems. So that's one of the reasons why that, yeah, you know, the dying process, what's going to happen next, very much depends on just, you know, what you've been doing for your life and the, the conditioning which you've had, the amount of ability to let go. Make any sense? Yeah, yeah. It's also the fact that often say that the meditation is a way of just practicing how to die. Learning how to let go. Because when you're meditating, you know, you can't take your friends with you into meditation, you can't take your loved ones. If you start thinking about what your loved one is up to, then you get sort of restless and you get distracted. So, you know, it's a way of just learning how to let go of you know, the past and the future and all the other things you have to do in life, you know, your, your family, your reputation, whatever happens, you just let that all go when you're meditating and also you learn how to let go of the body. You're actually learning how to die, practice. And if you do it well, then the body vanishes. Then you get into a nice mind state, understand what that is like, and then come back again and just, uh, when it really happens, when you do have to leave the body behind, you know how to do it really well. So the essence still is alive at so, in some point in some Are the ways. essence, that's something else. The essence is ne definitely not your body, so, and it's not experience, because that comes and goes. So to find out what the actual essence is, what people take to be the essence, the chitta, the mind, that comes in the next episode of the Word of the Buddha. <laughs> Very good. Oh, any other? Oh, we've got comments from overseas. Okay, better do this one before we finish off. Here we go. Okay, from Sri Lanka, from Canada, and oh, from the other side <laughs> of the world. <laughs> uh, in Majjhiminikaya number 10, that's the Satipatthana, do you abide being aware of the body, experience it? Do you initiate it or does it happen without your effort at the time? I think by the body experience, I think how you exp uh, the body experience, I think maybe referring to the third, uh, the third of the Anapanasati, uh, the mindfulness of the breath, because there it says you're aware of the whole body of breath, is Sabakaya Pati Sangwedi. And Sabakaya Pati Sangwedi being aware of the body experience, I think that that sometimes people say that that means being aware of the physical body. You know, it's a third part of Anapanasati. So Anapanasati, you know, it's a long, you know, breathing in, long breath, breathing out, long breath, short breath, short breath, being aware of the whole body of the breath. It, to me, that is always a misinterpretation of the meaning of that term body. It means kaya. The Buddha says the breath is the kaya, is the body here. So I think here you, know, you are meaning you are aware of the whole breath, the whole uh, accumulation of breath which is from the beginning of an in-breath to the end of an in-breath, the beginning of an out-breath to the end of the out-breath. So instead of just being aware of long, short, long, short, the breath becomes uh, more full, the whole of the breath. So from the beginning of an in-breath to the end of an in-breath, the beginning of an out-breath to the end of an out-breath, noticing the spaces in between, sort of like full awareness, the whole of the breath. I think that's what you mean there. Do you initiate it? Not really, because this is just what happens as you become more and more calm, more and more still, that what happens is that you just become more peaceful and you can see more. You can actually see the whole body of the breath from beginning to end. It's just what happens quite naturally. It's just like I was saying last, or was it last night? Yes. The story of walking up Kingsbury Drive, 
that when you went slower and slower and slower, you got out of the car, you started walking, you stopped walking and you actually stood still. When you stood still, you saw so much more of what was in that hillside. You saw the details of it and it looked very beautiful. The same way when you're doing breath meditation, as you go slower, you naturally see more of it. You know, just try just you know, walking down the street, you know, where you have your house or apartment. Walk more slowly. And then you see so much more. And actually stop and just stare. And so it's amazing when you just take the time to stop and stare, again you see so much more which you haven't seen before. As you go slower and slower and slower, this is uh, where you see more of the body. So being aware of the whole of the breath is actually where you, um, you don't initiate it, it just happens when you start to stop. Not when you start to stop, when you stop starting. <laughs> I hope that's what you mean. Okay, uh, from Canada, uh, oh no it's not, oh, it's, it's not from Canada, you got she typed in a, a name, it's a venerable. In order for the knowledge of suffering or nibbita to be unworldly unpleasant experience, to what extent does one need to be remain inclined to release? Uh, in other words, the uh, the unworldly suffering is unworldly suffering if it leads to you no know, uh, detaching from stuff, from letting go stuff. Uh, somebody was asking me earlier about uh, you know the the people who want um, to uh, want to uh, become enlightened, want to to stop suffering, the the desire, the craving to end existence. You know, it's called vibhavadanha. What's that difference between just you know, the aspiration to become enlightened? And it's, if it's a wanting, if it creates more wanting, more craving, that is the stuff which keeps things going. Already. Just I mentioned the will keeps the body going and later on we'll find out that will, that wanting also causes the, the consciousness to keep on going, the mind to keep on going. And it's the, this is where uh, the Buddha said in the dependent origination, it's the sankharas create the, or keep going, the vinyana, the consciousnesses. So it's the willing, it creates the consciousness, it doesn't stop it. So thinking that you can will yourself to Nibbana, it doesn't actually happen, it just it's Vibhavadanha. Well the Buddha said the dog chasing its own tail, you know what I use is the trying to eat your own head. It sounds possible but it's impossible. So trying to want to stop wanting obviously doesn't work. So uh, the unworldly experience, if it causes you to want something, then of course it will just lead to more experience. So if it leads, the negative experience leads you to abandon wanting, it's a part of the path, then it's going to be unworldly. It's going to lead out of the world rather than more existence. So that's where knowledge of suffering if it's the knowledge of the cause of suffering, we have nibbida towards wanting. This is nibbida is like, you know, just what am I doing this for? All this wanting stuff, controlling, just gets me into trouble. So when you see that uh, it's the wanting we have, uh, uh, if you want, you know, if you want, if you want to look at it this way, <laughs> it's so hard to get out of the word wanting that uh, wanting is a problem, so learn how to calm down to stop the wanting. You can't want to want. You can't want to let go of wanting. So how we do it is we just let go. Let go is the opposite of wanting. And wanting to let go, of course, is not letting go. I want to let go, come on. Let go, let go, let go, let go, let go, let go. So we have let go of wanting. So that is where the suffering, if the suffering causes the understanding to let go of wanting, then it works.
Any comments, questions here? Great. Okay. Okay, you got one. Okay. Oh, have you? Yeah. Good afternoon. I, I'm sorry I'm new to this, um, but I always enjoy your talks and your meditation. Um, I have a question and I'll s well, two questions really. Do you recognise um, Christmas? I noticed on Friday you had all yeah. the Christmas decorations up. Yes, indeed. We call it Buddhamus. <laughs> yes, we do. Okay. A celebration. In other words, uh, I did mention on Friday night that uh, the Buddha, uh, sorry, uh, Ajahn Chah used to say, well, what is Christmas anyway? You know, we celebrate sort of giving, uh, sharing, uh, being kind to all beings. Yeah, I can't see anything wrong with that. No, I'm, yeah. well, the one thing I've learned about Buddhism is that you seem to respect every, everyone and everything yeah. uh, in this world, so that's wonderful. Um, the other th uh, question was, have you read the book On Death and Dying by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I that's thought you would. But uh, it's, that's, it's true to a certain extent. But, you know, it's like one size fits all. There's great research, but not everyone just you know, has the, the rejection, the, uh, what's it called, like, you know, bearing your hand in the stand, it's not going to happen to me. It's not, they don't always have the anger. Some communities, they, they see death, they've understood it already, and they don't have grief. This was an experience, personal experience in Northeast Thailand, which was an indigenous culture, and no Westerners had ever actually um, gone into that place and colonized it. And it was very Buddhist culture, and for, I think, nine years I was there, never saw anybody crying at, the, at a death, at a funeral ceremony. It's a village. They were right next door. I used to go to there every day for arms round. They would come to see us. We were part of things. He never saw grief. So it was a celebration of life when someone died. It was an acceptance of life. Hmm. That life you know, will have death, and there's no fear about it. Wonderful. Is accepted. So the idea that you have to have those those stages, you know, before you get through things, is a wonderful little uh, piece of research. But you know, sometimes there's exceptions. Cultural. To see, you don't have to have grief. So you're saying cultural? Cultural, yeah. Mm, excellent. Thank it's you. It's grief is what our culture adds on to loss. And you see this, you know, when somebody like a princess Diana dies. It goes totally berserk. You know, not saying you disrespect you know, her, but it went so amazingly. Just people didn't even know her, and they were crying and just they're so sad and depressed. What's going on? Anyway, it's just that's you see what people add on to to loss is grief. It's, it's actually not necessary. <laughs> anyway. Now is the time to let you go. I let, okay, I'll let, uh, I'll let, let Eddie go. <laughs> it's okay. Onto the microphone. Yes, come on. Oh. Ajahn Brahm, just now you mentioned about one thing, you know. One thing, yeah. Yeah, and letting go of one thing. Yeah. Yeah. I take one thing as desire, same as desire. Desire, craving, yes. Yeah, yeah. The Buddha did say, you know, I read in the Sutta, he says, having desire is suffering. Not achieving what we desire is also suffering.